Oh, and also happy Chinese New Year. Today is uh, Chinese New Year Eve. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, invite Pia uh, Sorosen. Uh, she's uh, a preceptor in chemical engineer and applied material at the uh, John Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Science at Harvard University. And she leads Harvard Science and Cooking Program, uh, well, which is probably one of the most popular courses, not just in campus, but also around the Harvard community. Uh, she has uh, a new book coming out. And I, I got this book uh, you know, just recently. I thoroughly enjoyed reading it, called Science and Cooking. And she's also teaching a Harvard X course called Food Fermentation. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's give the stage to Pia. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Chen, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation um, to, to all of you. Thank you to Chen and Wendy for organizing and thank you guys for being here. Um, this is, I've admired the work coming out of your department for a long time and as is often the case at Harvard, um, even though you're really just a 10 minute walk from Pierce Hall where my office is, um, many of you, I, I think maybe most all of you, I have not officially met, so it's nice to meet you. Um, and I'm excited to, um, I'm excited to talk to people who are interested in food, but I'm also really excited to be talking to people who come at this from an education angle. Um, so, 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 so I'll just make that general comment. Um, and I think I'm going to start, let's see. I'm going to start by sharing my screen actually. And um, let's see. So you should now see my screen. And I just wanna make this window a little bigger so I can see you guys at the same time. And then I also just want to bring up the chat so that I have it just in case. Okay, so what I want to do today is my, my the, this entire talk is at the intersection of science and food and education. Um, and in particular, I will be focusing on food fermentation and flavor. And what I will do is I'm going to tell you a little bit of um, why teaching science with food is useful or effective, uh, why we would bother. Then I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of how we've been doing it for the last 10 years, myself and my colleagues. And then I'm going to give an example of my most recent endeavor doing this, which um, you won't be surprised to hear that it's connected to fermentation. So I'm excited that there are a few fermenters in the audience. Um, so that's the plan. But I'm going to start by showing you this picture. And you can just sort of admire it. And maybe if you're not into steak, because not everyone is into steak, maybe you can admire this picture instead. You just kind of keep that in your mind. Uh, I know it's early, but maybe you're getting hungry. And I, 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 I have a question for you. Um, and the question is, even if you don't know a lot about food science. The question is, what science concepts would be involved in making this food? And again, if you really dislike thinking about steak, just think about this one. Um, and feel free to, to just call it out or put it in the chat or um, just like tell me something. What science concepts are involved in making this food or this food? The steak would be the Maillard reaction. Maillard reactions, great. So that's the browning that happens on the surface. Anything else? Probably got conduction um, for the inside of the steak to cook. Right, exactly. There's, there's got to be some kind of diffusion of heat that goes into the steak, right? So. So as that heat diffuses in, that's govern, governed by certain physical laws. And you can even kind of see the effect on, on the steak itself. Okay, good, anything else? Something to do with the salt and maybe even the oils from the rosemary. 
Oh, great. I actually didn't think of that. But obviously, there's something with the salt. The salt is probably changing. Maybe it's drawing um, water out of the cells with osmosis. Maybe there's something with oils in the rosemary and the way those flavor molecules in the rosemary is interacting with, with the fats and, and the flavors in the meat. Okay, that's great. Anything else? Can you go back to the dessert picture? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, you're not going to say, yeah. I was, so there's an airy. I was, was going to suggest. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to suggest that the, um, the steak also had some preservation that had to have occurred for it to get to us. Oh, great. There's something that happened to the steak before it ended up on your plate. And that was some kind of preservation, maybe refrigeration or freezing. And there's certainly, certainly science involved in that. Yeah. Anything else? There's the leavening agents in the cake that cause it to chemically, or the ingredients to chemically react and to rise. Exactly, the chemical reactions, the kinetics of chemical reactions, the gas that is produced with that leavening agent, um, the gas, the whole idea of that gas expanding, how much does one mole of gas even expand at room temperature and from standard pressure? Great, anything else? Pat, I know you're gonna say something about the whipped cream on top. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. So just um, something about the structure of the molecules of the cream that kind of let it hold up the air. Right. So there's whipped cream on top. And how do you make whipped cream? Well, you whip and whip and whip it. And as you do that, you incorporate air into little bubbles and you turn this cream into a foam. And that foam and the, consistent, the consistency and the viscosity of that foam is going to be, be determined by how many of those little air bubbles there are, how densely packed are they, um, what is the Laplace pressure inside the bubbles that kind of holds them and keeps them as bubbles? How does the material flow over time as you whip it? Right, great, awesome. Anything else? I think the same concepts probably apply to the cake batter as well, because you know one of the major rules of like making a cake batter is do not over whip because it will become uh, very dense. So I'm guessing there it also has to do with the I think the gluten molecules, maybe, I'm not really sure, in the flour and how you just want to mix it and not like over mix because that'll make it very dense in the right. molecules structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's something about this kind of physics and chemistry that happens as you mix it. And you mentioned the gluten molecules, which are long polymers and the way they behave can be explained with polymer physics. Um, they can be, be explained with random walks. I'm just using, I mean, if the if these concepts are not sort of ring a bell, it doesn't matter. I, I'm just saying these are all science concepts that, that show up. And one thing I would mention with the steak is, of course, there's protein denaturation and what happens to proteins as we heat them and how does a protein unravel and how do those proteins um, then coagulate and how does that even lead to this change in color and what in any way is the physics of color and how that works. And I see Frank in the, in the chat is saying there's obviously a phase transition. There is the liquid in the water inside the steak, which is turning into steam as the steak cooks. And we can just spend a lot of time talking about that. So great. So we're all warm. And um, I think we got a lot of the science concepts in these two foods. And um, I'm going to show you this next food. So. This you may even not necessarily know right off the top of your head what it is or if it's even edible, but if I were to tell you that it's edible, presumably you would be thinking, huh, how did that even happen? Why did they do that? What scientific principles underlie this weird apple that kind of looks moldy and not delicious at all? And what is this little blob of liquid anyway? Um, so even if we, regardless of whether we know what a food is and we have some sense of how it's made or whether we really don't know a food at all, it tends to be something that has a wide variety of science concepts in it and it tends to be something that kind of piques our interest. So the, the, there are many, many advantages of teaching science with food and I, I hope that by the end of today I will have convinced you of some of these, but, but just to kind of put some, put some of them on, on the map. And some of them we have kind of talked about already. One obvious thing which we all just came across is that the 
really wide variety of science concepts that can be covered just with food are, 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 are really diverse and they range from biology to chemistry to physics, even to engineering. And even if we go outside of the sciences, there are all kinds of connections to the humanities and to the social sciences connections to how does this connect to history and how we have traditionally cooked and fed ourselves and fed our societies? How is this connected to the current food system and how that piece of meat goes from, you know, the cow and through the whole system and ends up, ends up on our plate. So it's sort of ripe with all kinds of connections. Then food is also very accessible and inclusive. It's part of everyday life for, for all of us, doesn't matter who you are. Um, it is also accessible in the sense that all of the concepts, pretty much all of the concepts you just mentioned are concepts that doesn't matter what food you pick, they're gonna show up there. It doesn't matter uh, where the food is from, you know, what the background is, the concepts are going to be there. And I could put pretty much any picture up there and a lot of the same science concepts would, would basically show up. It's also engaging and piques our interests. And then this one I really like, which is that it's engaging in the sense of being science concepts that are connected to our senses and to our bodies. It's tactile, it's very visual. Um, I noticed a lot of smiles on your faces as you were looking at the foods and thinking about them. Um, it's flavorful, so it's very connected to sort of our, our overall experience. And then of course, the process of cooking food is very hands-on, very experimental, um, can be hypothesis-driven. If I want to fix my steak and have it be um, cooked in a different way, how would I fix it? By trial and error, you can figure out the answer, which is really a format of the scientific inquiry process. You can do a lot of these hands-on experiments with sustainable materials, at least sustainable in the sense of um, the discussion about making chemistry education green using non-toxic um, ingredients and reactants for various processes. And, which is especially useful in this day and age, the labs for, for these kinds of experiments can usually be done at home, right? We all have a lab, it's in our kitchen, we can all go out there and engage with these processes. And finally, there is a large part of creativity and problem solving and analysis that goes on, not only when we cook and when we try to figure out a problem, but also when we try to just make something new. And this is true for, for all of us as we're sort of cooking our mac and cheese in our kitchens, but it's also true for cutting edge chefs who are really trying to push the boundaries of what do we even consider food? What ingredients can we manipulate so that we can call them food? What about making delicious things from seaweeds or um, jellyfish or all kinds of food sources that we currently don't use? What about being creative around food in a way that really makes you think about food in a different way? Um, all of this involves a lot of creativity. So with this in mind, what, what I plan to do is first I want to give you a little bit of background how we've been doing this for the last 10 years. So basically doing this, what's on this list, is what I've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, I have been deeply involved in teaching science through food, through um, various different media um, to various audiences, everything from K through 12 to, to undergrads, to um, distance learners, to online, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I wanna just tell you a little bit about the background of this and I, uh, especially for those of you, I think if you have been around Harvard for a while, some of this won't be news to you, but in order for all of you to kind of be on the same page and kind of hear the history of this, um, I just want to spend a few slides um, tell, telling you about this. So the, the science and cooking program at Harvard 
got started in 2010. And this was around the same time when Harvard was reworking its what was previously the core curriculum and what then since then has become the general education curriculum. And the course was started as a general education course. Um, it was started by Michael Brenner and David Waits, both at CIS. Dave is a physicist, Michael is a mathematician, and I came on board after the first semester as the kind of token chemist and biologist. Um, so this class has been given every fall semester since then, um, has about between 70 and 350 students every fall, varies a little bit. And um, I'm gonna tell you more about it, but from this course has also grown a public lecture series. Let me see, are there any show of hands of anyone who's attended one of these? They occur every Monday night. Yeah, Chem has, okay. So, so to tell you about this, what we do is we bring in chefs. This is Joanne Chang. Um, they show up in the Science Center, uh, Hall C, and people from the general public in Boston, Cambridge area, sometimes even New England, they come in and the chef cooks something and uh, we talk about the science. So, so this, this lecture series draws about 350 people a week. And last semester, as you can imagine, we, we did it all online instead to, to, to a much larger audience, um, surprisingly. Um, from, from these two ventures, in 2013, we developed an online class on edX. So this was in the very early days of the MOOC era. Um, we basically converted the class to online, converted the labs to be at-home labs that people took from around the world. We visited um, chef's kitchens and kind of filmed them there. And today we've had like close to a half a million people from around the world who've taken the class. And from this, we've used those materials to teach various online and hybrid courses through the Harvard DCE program. And we've also used the materials to do various outreach activities, um, K through 12 outreach. And this picture here is a picture of a group of teachers from the greater Boston area um, going through a kind of workshop slash um, brainstorming session for how to bring these lessons that we're teaching in a college setting to uh, K through 12 education. And then the most recent thing is in October last year, we kind of put all of these ideas together into a book. And th since this is just a few, a few months ago, I'm still very attached to it. So I'm adding it here. And, in the lower right. So, um, so, so that's kind of an overview of what we've been doing. And um, what, what I want to just show you a little bit before I go on is to, to show you how we've been doing it. Um, and I will do this in the context of the college course at Harvard. Um, and, and, and this is just a few slides to kind of put it in context of what we actually do. And so what we do is we have kind of divided all the concepts in cooking and boiled them down to 10 major concepts. And those are all listed here. They range from um, energy and heat to phase transitions, elasticity, how squishy things are, diffusion, heat transfer, viscosity. For each of these weeks, we invite a chef from um, the US or the world. This is the list of chefs from last fall where um, Harold McGee, who you may have heard of, he is the author of this big fat book, which is considered the Bible in the science of cooking called On Food and Cooking. He usually opens our lectures with a history of the science of cooking. Joanne Chang was there. Nina Compton from New Orleans um, was talking about um, Southern cooking. Louis Ellen Frank was talking about Native American cooking. Maya Warren, who is the ice cream scientist at Coldstone Creamery, talked about the emulsions and foams in ice cream. Um, Garima talked about the science of Indian food. 
Um, and there was some drinks in there and there was some food fermentations. And Jose talked about how he's trying to reach a wider audience through food. Okay, so that's the overview of um, a semester. And the way this would look in a typical week would be something like this. So this is the week called phase transitions. And the week would basically start with a visit by a chef. And the chef for that week is our beloved Joanne Chang of Flower Bakery. Um, she would usually cook all kinds of things, but the most spectacular is probably this dessert here called a croquembouche, which all rests on the science of the phase transitions that occur in sugar as you heat it. So the science for this week would range from phase transitions, which you guys already mentioned, bond energy, boiling point elevation that happens as you have a solute in a solution, freezing point depression, which happens when you have a solute in a solution at colder temperatures, um, the science of crystallization and nucleation. And then we would collect all of the concepts in an equation of the week. And this is the equation that basically determines how much energy a molecule has to have used the energy, how much molecule does it have to have right at the phase transition when it goes from a liquid to a gas. And then when we were done lecturing and, and uh, Joanne had wowed us with her amazing cooking, the students go into the lab and they make ice cream. Turns out that the, the, the freezing of ice cream all depends on the phase transition that happens and the freezing point depression that happens when you have sugar in a solution and how do you make that solution freeze? So they apply the equation of the week. They also use the Van Hoft equation for those chemists among, amongst you. And, and then they go home and they eat the lab and they're happy sometimes. Okay, so that's one example of a week. And just to give you one more example. Um, oh, I see a comment that Joanne Chang has the best sticky events ever. She does, she does. So just to give you one more example, this is the structure of another typical week. And now you kind of know the structure, but in this week, the science concept is diffusion. And the chef of that week is Ferran Adria of the former El Bui restaurant in Spain. Um, he is the inventor of this thing called spherification. If that's, you may have heard of it. It's one of those kind of modernist cuisine um, fancy dishes that chefs were really excited about for a few years. Right now it's totally out of fashion, but scientifically it's really cool. And it's cool because it involves a gelation of a thin shell of a food, which um, when you put it in your mouth, it basically explodes and there's sort of delicious explosion of flavors. So to get this right, you really need to understand both the diffusion of small molecules, in this case is the diffusion of calcium ions that, that move into um, this, this liquid. Um, the idea of random walks, which is really the idea of how small molecules would move in a solution, protein denaturation and coagulation, um, how polymers and gels even work. And this here is the equation of the week, which is basically the equation that tells you how long T does it take for some substance that moves at a certain rate D to go a certain distance L? So that's the equation. And the lab for that week is, may not be clear from this picture, but the lab for that week is to make ceviche. So taking raw fish, infusing it with lime juice. Lime juice, of course, is filled with, with acids, citric acid, and those diffuse into the raw fish. And as they do that, they cause a change in the color and the texture of the food. And by applying this equation, you can actually estimate how quickly do these small molecules move into the food. And if you assume that food is mostly water, which it is, then you can basically get a D, like a constant, and you can compare it to the literature and it actually won't be that far off. So by using fish and lime juice, you can get to 
a scientific constant. Okay. So those are two examples and all of this kind of culminates in, we do this for 10, 11, 12 weeks. And when there's about four or five weeks of the semester left, we stop doing labs and then we dive into student projects. And the idea behind the student project is something that I touched upon before, which is this idea that when chefs innovate, when they experiment, they do trial and error, they fail a lot, it doesn't work out. They have to really think about creative solutions. And all of this is related to how scientists also sort of should think, how they, how they do think. Um, they innovate, they experiment, they reevaluate their results. And so the student project has the task of studying and explaining in scientific terms some aspect of a recipe or culinary invention or to provide a solution to a culinary problem and then explain in scientific terms why or how it solves the problem. So that's the task. And just to give you an idea, I have three or four examples. This is um, chocolate pasta. So Delaney, Moscoso and Topol really wanted the idea, the, they really wanted to make pasta that tastes like chocolate, but that also has that al dente springiness that a really good pasta has. And they didn't want some bland, you know, flour mixed up with some chocolate flavor. They wanted 100% chocolate in their pasta. So they measured the elastic modulus of normal pasta and then they took chocolate and they experimented with adding various thickening agents, gelling agents, polymers, um, finally settled on guar gum and uh, sometimes in combinations with other gums and eventually found that perfect elastic modulus. Now they had 100% chocolate pasta and it was actually delicious. Here it is sprinkled with a little sea salt. Um, Victoria, was interested in how the lactose content varies in cheese over time. And she studied the lactose content using one of those glucose meters that diabetics can use. Um, it turns out that lactose, when it falls apart, it falls apart to get lactose and glucose. And she measured that glucose. And she found that, yes, indeed, aged cheddar has not so much lactose, whereas fresh mozzarella has a lot. Doug and Kyle decided to use a chemical um, instrument called a rotovap. Here's a picture. Rotovaps basically work like distillers, except they work at, at low pressure. And they put ketchup in the distiller, um, boiled off the liquid, got a liquid that sort of smelled and tasted like ketchup, but with all, without all of the tomato flavors. So they got this. Then they matched the consistency with actual ketchup. Was delicious. Um, then they decided to also put some whiskey in it, which I'm still not quite sure why they did. But, but it, was, <laughs> it was delicious and, and they had really produced a new food. And finally, Eric was interested in which components of chewing gum really make chewing gum be chewy for longer. Um, you know, you chew a piece of gum and then after a while it's like, oh, I don't want that anymore, I'll put it out. So he built a little, he was sort of a builder. He was good at building things. So he built a chewing machine, uh, which basically had this lever move up and down, chewing this chewing gum for a very long time. And then he experimented with different amounts of oil, different amounts of stevia, different amounts of gum, and, and eventually sort of found the perfect combination that, that can be chewed for the longest. Okay, so that's a little background um, of, of what we've done in that class and, and sort of how that works. So what I want to do now is I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about a project that has sort of been my passion for the last few years. Um, and in order 
to do that, I'm gonna show you this picture and I'll ask you what you think these foods have in common. And parts of my talk have, has already given it away. So mm -hmm. any ideas, yell it out or put it in the chat. Salt. Oh, there's some salt in there. Um, Fermentation. Fermentation, exactly. So all of these are fermented foods. If you're wondering what this is, this is tempeh, um, chocolate, kimchi, soy sauce, miso. All of them are, are, are fermented foods. And uh, I don't know, most of them have salt. I guess wine doesn't really have salt, although I hear that adding a little bit of salt to wine can actually really bring out the flavors more. And adding salt to chocolate is not bad either. So that wasn't totally bad, but fermentation, fermentation. So this is captured in a course that I've been teaching for the last few years called Flavor Molecules of Food Fermentations. Um, and in order to kind of put you in the mood for what this looks like, I'm gonna show this video. So this is a close up of sauerkraut um, as you ferment, as you fermented. So basically, if, if, for those of you less familiar, you make sauerkraut by taking cabbage, chopping it, um, massaging it with some salt, like 2% salt. And you, over time, as you massage it, the water goes out of the cells by osmosis. So you produce some brine. Then you stuff it into a um, mason jar and um, over time, the very, you don't even add microbes, no microbes added. Over time, the about 1% of the microbes living on raw cabbage is a lactic acid bacteria called leuconostic mesenteritis. Not important, but this is one kind of bacterium that can convert the glucose in the cabbage into lactic acid. And it also, as it does that, it, it also produces gas. So I want to show you a close up. So this is a time lapse of the cabbage fermenting over the course of like a week. So you can see the gas being produced, and then the cabbage changes color. Right, and the reason the cabbage is changing color is because the color compounds in cabbage are pH sensitive. So they actually go from this brilliant green to this more drab um, yellow. And in the process, in, in addition to lactic acid, you also get all kinds of other flavor molecules that kind of come out over time. And, and basically all of what you're watching here is this beautiful interplay of um, microbial communities producing flavor, producing molecules, which transforms the food, both in terms of the flavor and the texture. So this, this resonated with me in the sense that during the years when I was teaching science and cooking, um, there were certain things that kept coming up over and over. And one of them was, which is exemplified by this picture on the right, um, the prevalence of using food fermentations in haute cuisine amongst chefs as a way to produce new flavors. So all these chefs would come to town and they would talk about the new fermentations they did. And then at the same time, um, over the last few years, there's kind of been this boom in home fermentations. Um, so any of you may have been to the Boston Fermentation Festival, droughts like thousands and thousands of people every year. Um, all the people making sourdough during the pandemic, people homebrewing, it's, it's just really, really a trend. And a lot of this sort of overlaps with my own background. So I mentioned before how my background is in chemical biology and sort of synthesizing molecules and understanding natural products and how they can be used for cancer research. Now, natural products are, are also what's causing flavor and they come from the microbes. So all of this kind of come, comes together beautifully into a small number of concepts where the fermented foods um, and the flavors that come from those foods, the microbes that produce those flavors, and then the design element that is used as you create and kind of add on to these, food, these foods. 
Um, so, so the way this class works is basically you learning about the hands-on practice, the culture, the history, the science, learning about the properties of small molecules, the taste and the aroma molecules, how you would characterize them, the biochemistry, the physiology, the microbial communities that, that, um, that cause them, um, the metabolism, the characterization, and then the kind of project-driven scientific process. So in this class, we uh, ferment all kinds of things. This is the fermentation table from last spring, probably just around this time. Um, pandemic was, was yet not a thing. Um, so we ferment all kinds of things, but I wanna tell you about this course in the context of one project that we've been working on for, for um, the last two years. And this project goes back to a problem. Historically speaking, food fermentations are all solutions to a problem, which often is that at some point you produce huge quantities of food and that food is going to spoil and you want to find a way to keep it. And um, the problem with having a cow, of course it's a blessing in many ways, but, but it produces a lot of milk. Um, even modern cows produce a lot more milk than ancient cows, but still between two to eight gallons of milk per day. That's a lot of milk, a lot, a lot of milk. And the solution to this problem basically shows up in every culture that has had a strong culture of dairy, different kinds of dairy. And um, this ranges from all kinds of yogurts to um, all kinds of cheeses, all kinds of in-betweens like buttermilks and mazzoni and, and, um, and sour cream and so on. So this here is a selection of some, some of those fermented products. And most of these are various yogurts. So Finnish um, yogurt, pima and fili, Swedish filmjölk, um, Bulgarian and Greek yogurt, and then there's Matsoni, which is a Georgian yogurt. Um, so what we did second day of class, without telling students too much, we just set out and we fermented tons of yogurts. Um, I'm showing you some of them here, Greek, Bulgarian, Matsoni, there's about, I think we did another three or four, maybe five. Uh, we also made pime and field milk and, and um, kefir. And then we use this as an opportunity to talk about the science that happens as the milk, which is relatively bland, transverse over time um, into this viscous, thicker fluid that has a different flavor. And we talk about things like the bacterial communities, the pH and pKa and how that works, different pathways in the microbes that cause, that cause different kinds of flavor molecules the protein denaturation and coagulations that happens in the yogurt as it transfers over time and how gels work and how the viscous fluid turns into a more thicker, more viscous fluid and how that kind of even gets to have a small elasticity over time. And then we have all these yogurts. And I mentioned before how one of the strengths of using food fermentations is, or food, in, in teaching is that it's connected to our bodies. But one of the things we never got a chance to really dig into in, in the other classes I've taught on this is, well, how do we really quantify that flavor? How, how do we do it? And there are kind of two main ways. Um, both of them have their pros and cons, but the main one is to use what's called sensory analysis. And um, this is basically one of the ways to really be scientific about how to quantify what the flavor in a food is. So I invited uh, Maya Grace, who is a sensory scientist, and she basically turned the entire class into a flavor panel. And she trained us very carefully. She made sure we could taste all of the five different tastes um, she gave us this careful spreadsheet of things. Um, we portioned out the yogurts into little cups and um, they were numbered so you didn't know what you were tasting. And then it was completely silent as everyone were filling out these things and just eating more yogurt 
uh, than they probably ever wanted to do. All of this data we then put together into um, the, what, what's called, this is how flavor profiles are usually um, presented. And this may not seem very exciting to you, but I can tell you that if you spent 40 minutes puzzling over how would I describe this one over this yogurt, then you stare at this and you're fascinated. So just to point out a few things, one of the things we found that was that Bulgarian and Greek yogurts tend to have this very sour, acidic, tangy flavor. Not very surprising. But then there are these kind of Nordic um, cold climate varieties yeah. that tended to have some bitter flavor, but also some, some of this like old, stable, horse, manure kind of strange flavor, which some people kind of liked. And some people are like, ah, oh, I don't know about that. So this was our first dive into flavor. Um, what, what the next exercise centered around something that has been become increasingly important in the way we think about flavor scientifically. And that relates to the idea of multisensory flavor perception. So what this idea is that yes, we may think that flavor is only the taste on our tongue and maybe to some degree, uh, or really very, very much to a large degree, the aroma we smell in our noses, but it turns out that our other senses, the color of a food or the sounds we hear as we eat a food, that all of these things are also really important for how we experience flavor. So flavor is what we feel, but it's also how our brains sort of interpret that information. And so to, to do this, we did an experiment and I only did this last year. Um, I invited Ben Hogue, who is a musician and a professor at the Berkeley College of Music. He um, is very, part of his kind of career is to design music experiences music to various experiences. And he has collaborated with a lot of restaurants, including Mugaritz restaurant in Spain, um, in creating music that basically kind of lifts, lifts the experience of, of dining there or for specific dishes. And so we, for two sessions, we brought together my class with his class and people worked in teams, so some stu two students from my class, two students from his class, worked on teams to try to design music that really sort of accentuated the flavor experience of the different flavors. So I'm gonna show you, I'm actually gonna play one of these to you. So now you should imagine having a piece of yogurt, taking it and then just sort of imagine the kind of sour flavor, this slight fizziness, and then see what you think about this music. There. So that was that was a Greek yogurt, and some of the off-flavored yogurts had these very these very ominous soundtracks, like something horrible is about to happen. Um, so so this was kind of our foray into the multisensory aspects of flavor, and then it was time to go scientific, and so we spent a lot of time reading about the small molecules that cause flavor. Um, how do you detect those flavors? How does gas and liquid chromatography and mass spec work? These are basically the instruments that are used to quantify the molecules that cause flavors. They're also used for other things, but, but also for flavor molecules. And then we went on a field trip to the um, small molecule mass spec facility in the Northwest building at, at Harvard. And we, um, 
brought our yogurts and we analyzed them and we got plots that kind of look like this one. So here, each of these columns is one yogurt and the mess you see here are all the molecules. But if you kind of analyze this data, then you would get a PCA plot, plot that kind of looks like this. And that basically tells you that the bees, uh, the Pima Avili and Mazzoni, which, um, which kind of occur together on this plot, have more similarity in their flavor molecules. And traditional yogurt is very different, and Greek and Bulgarian are kind of in their own, in their own flavor space. And then we looked at some of the particular flavor molecules and we used gas chromatography um, to do this. And we got this long list of various molecules that were found in the different yogurts. In this case, these are the most prevalent ones. 2-butanone has a kind of paint glue um, odor. Propionic acid, let's see, where is it here? Has a kind of body odor to it and pyrazine and pyrrole are kind of nutty. So some yogurts have a kind of nuttiness and that's usually due to these pyrazines and pyrroles. Then we were interested in who are the microbes that cause these flavor molecules. And so we prepped our yogurts for sequencing. We um, used this as an opportunity to talk about how does sequencing even work? How has, um, the um, sort of the evolution of the sequencing techniques evolved even over the last 20 years that allows us to now do things with sequencing that we um, could not do before. And then we sequenced all of our yogurts. And this is just one, one of them. This is the traditional yogurt. And you can basically what you do is you look in the upper right here and you look, see that there's some bifidobacterium and some lactobacillus acidophilus and some delbruchi. Um, and then the homework, right? The, the big half semester homework was look at all this data, um, compare the microbial communities to the flavor molecules, to the sensory analysis, and see if you can figure out what's going on here. And um, this, it's, a, it's a little tricky, but there were some things we definitely found, which was that some of the yogurts that had that very strong off flavor, the kind of barn horse um, flavor, they um, were found to have some of those odor molecules that um, like the body odor, the, those kind of the molecules were like, hmm, I'm not sure I wanna eat those. And they also tended to have in them small amounts of pseudomonas which is actually not um, recommended in food at all. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a sign that something has gone bad. Um, so so th this is how it's all connected, the microbes, the flavors, and the molecules. Very briefly before I wrap up, I'm almost done. Um, we spent then some time, the, the sort of overall goal of this is for students to conduct a project, a substantive original project, and, and to kind of nudge and inspire students to do that. We have various visiting speakers, um, including people who really are at that interface of being creative with fermentation. And this includes people like various cheese makers. Cheese is obviously kind of the next step of yogurt, more advanced yogurt. Um, it involves various chefs, such as the team of Mugaritz in Spain, um, the Nordic Food Lab in Copenhagen, Noma in Copenhagen, but it also involves some local um, companies that are using fermentation as a way to create new flavors, new foods, just new molecules in general. So there have been various projects over the years. I'm going to skip this one. This one is a project um, by Taylor. She was interested in if fermenting foods makes them more, um, having more calories that are bioavailable. And she had access to a zebrafish facility. So she fermented food, served, served this to the fish, fermented and unfermented, and basically saw that fermented food leads to, um, leads to, to, to more spawning than unfermented food or giving fish no food at all. 
So this is a sign, right? It was a small study, but this is a sign that fermenting foods really does give more, more bioavailable calories. Um, this Adriana and Stephanie, they managed to speed up meat fermentation using ultrasonification. And uh, David and Evan showed that by adding fermented grains to soil, you can get more growth of grass than if you add nothing at all. Okay, so before, before I wrap up, I just wanna show you something because obviously the big question is, did, did they learn and did they engage? When I started teaching this class, I, I realized that this is not a um, required course. No one has to be here. Um, students show up because they are already curious. They're already interested. The biggest mistake I could possibly do as an instructor is to kill that interest. So I was really kind of trying to maintain this sense of curiosity and inquiry and engagement that I kind of sensed from the students. So um, I'm gonna, I did that by asking two questions. One was, how often did you discuss or look up topics related to this course outside of class? So like, how often did you kind of just go and look things up on your own? And um, found that in general, people did this about two to four times per week, um, which I was kind of happy about. I was like, good, like we do all these, these exercises in class, but then when you go home, you have further questions and you kind of check them out. Um, I also asked students if they thought at the end of the class, if they thought they would be interested in continuing to be interested in fermentation news. And many of them said that they either agree or strongly agree. And this thing that I skipped over here um, was me asking a survey question of rating how much they learned from the various components of the course. So basically the way to read this is before the class, most people felt that they were not so knowledgeable or somewhat knowledgeable in most of the course topics, which we covered in the course. But when I asked them after the course, the same question, they felt that they were very knowledgeable or, or knowledgeable. So obviously the, these are sort of self-assessments, right? There are limitations to those, but, but it was a first start for me to start looking into um, if this was even working. The very last thing I wanted to know was, do students continue doing this? Or, like, do things happen after the course is over? And um, I do continue to get notices from students every now and then. About a year ago, Molly um, Levins came running to me. She was like, guess what this is? And I was like, I have no idea. She's like, taste it. It turned out it was the soy sauce that we made in class that she had actually fermented and brought with her from apartment to apartment for like the last one year. Um, Evan um, continued his project and published a paper in Edible Boston. And Lauren and Brian both are kind of fermenting on their own um, in, in their current jobs, like doing finance and uh, being in medical school. So, so, so that's about the course so far. And the most recent thing on the horizon is that I've been working to convert this fermentation course into an online course for the last few years. And it's actually launching on Harvard X in two weeks. Um, I produced it with Roberto Coulter, who is a professor emeritus of microbiology. So if you're interested in food fermentations, check this out. We do various things in the course, like use the home as a resource to do at home experiences, experiments. We um, use the fact that when you teach MOOCs, you really have a sort of expandable, movable classroom. So we have lots of field trips and speakers um, and so on. So feel free to check that out. And I'm going to end here and just quickly acknowledge Michael Brenner and David Waits, who have been teaching the Science of Cooking course with me for a long time and who are really wonderful and generous mentors. Uh, Patricia and Mai are TFs who have been working with me on the fermentation course, Roberto and Coulter from Harvard X, 
and uh, all that visiting chefs and speakers and field trips host in the class and C's and Harvard X. And thank you to all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So wonderful talk. Uh, any questions? Uh, I saw a lot of a lot of chats. Uh, yeah. Anyone want to speak up to comments, questions? Excuse me, but what was that fuzzy piece of fruit? What? Great. That's a great question. The fuzzy, the fuzzy piece of fruit is a small apple, a crab apple, that has been um, inoculated on the surface with a mold, an edible mold, which is usually the mold that's used to make tempeh, called Rhizophis oligosporus. And it kind of grows on the surface. And as it does that, it breaks down some of the sugars in the apple and makes it slightly sweeter. So it's one of the foods that are, are served at Mugaritz restaurant in Spain. And of course, when you get it, you're like, oh, thank you for giving me a moldy apple. <laughs> and then you eat it. And, and um, it's, it's, it's one of those, these typical Mugaritz and really sort of fancy chef's tricks of having you question what is food and what's not? And what am I willing to eat and what's not? And would I even eat this weird looking thing that actually is pretty delicious when I bite into it? Thank you. You know, I'm going to add to that music to the yogurt. I don't know why that music made my mouth water. <laughs> Whoa, that's great. That's weird. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, there is something to it. Thank you. Thanks. So do you eat the mold that's on the outside of the apple or do you brush it off first and then you just eat it? You eat it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's made under quite sterile conditions. Um, and, and in small amounts, it's, it's, the mold itself is safe to eat. The issue is if there's anything else growing there, but if it's made under the right conditions, you can eat it. I have a pedagogy question. Well, first I just wanted to say, thank you so much. I love this talk and I, I know Wendy's recording it. I'm gonna, um, encourage my kids to watch it. They're both like, they both love to cook and they're both nerdy little scientists. So, uh, so um, the question that I have is that it's clear that you're covering so many topics in science and you know, sort of the traditional way of teaching science is that it's kind of this linear process where you have to learn this thing before you learn that thing. And you know, it's something that we encounter a lot in our curriculum development where like, well, how much background do we give them in order to really make sure they understand this concept? And do we have time to do that? So like, how do you kind of find that balance between giving them enough information to really understand the topic while not having to do too much background while their eyes glaze over? And yeah, that's such a good, it's such a good question. And I think, in general, teaching, I, I would almost say in general teaching science class, science classes at Harvard because people come from such different, and not just at Harvard, but people come from such different backgrounds. But I, I think especially these science classes that are kind of gen ed classes because you have a range of students from, um, you know, the eager freshmen who just took AP Chem and AP whatever, um, and the senior, who may have done some of those things, but it's four years ago, and um, that there you just can't you just have to assume that there is a lot of disparity in people's background. So, and and I one of the I have these days from early memories from early in the class where we basically on post-it notes we wrote down all the concepts and we sat in front of a whiteboard and we ordered them and we stared at it and we basically had conversations along the lines of we can't talk about elasticity until we've talked about polymers and we can't talk about polymers before we talk about um whatever random walks and so so there was some of that and then we work with 
having, and this has kind of grown over time. It's one of those things you don't have when a class is new, but then you grow it over time. Um, built up sort of a repository of um, review materials. So students can go there and, and you know, if you wanna have a refresher on pH, go here. If you want a refresher on this, go there. But it's, it's tricky, yeah. Thank you. And you know, it's especially tricky in a big course too, because you're not gonna know Right in these 300 people classes, in in this my small fermentation class, I cap the number at 22 students, and I feel like I'm much more able to kind of do one-on-one -on -one catching up. I know that they didn't take or go, or I know I know that I know sort of where I can push people, um, and that works that works okay in a smaller class. But as soon as the numbers increase, that's much harder. Yeah, great question. I just wanted to um, um, comment on something that I hadn't thought of until you know watching this. And thank you, what a fabulous presentation. My mouth's been watering for the last hour. But um, you know, with the push for STEM, we always we we focus on um, specific, sometimes often silos of science, technology, engineering, and math. But but you know, cooking and food and baking, etc. You know, after after watching how you so eloquently outlined all of this and how it ties together, this is absolutely STEM. It fits every single aspect of STEM. And I work with I, I advise a program, after school program, out of school science program on um, it's called Lab Girls. And one of the things that they do is bring in a female scientist and who talks to the you know group of middle school girls and they have high school mentors uh, about you know what they do in their field. And then the girls, you know, they, they all do a lab or an activity, you know, under the tutelage of this female scientist, but they absolutely could be conducting, you know, have a chef, um, you know, female chef or baker come in and, and this like tags every single piece of STEM. So I'm not sure that, that we think of food and cooking as fitting the bill for STEM, but it certainly does. And so thank you for um, highlighting that. This was wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I really agree. And, um, and I think also it, it doesn't necessarily apply to all chefs because many, many chefs cook the way they're like, this is how I do this. And I always did it this way. But I think the chefs who really are very inquisitive and who are constantly questioning, which the best, you know, the good ones are, um, I think it absolutely applies. Yeah, great. That's awesome. Uh, Frank? See, I found that feature for raising your hand. Uh, so thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, and yes, th this is what I, yeah, I remember when we, uh, in my career in academia and whatnot, we, the scientists were always trying to bring science to the masses and how can you create lab science at home? And so there was always this, this term that we would use is kitchen science. You sort of flip that on its head that it's always been science <laughs> with the ingredients that we have at our, that have at hand and, and that we consume every day. But a few things I, I wanted to ask about was, uh, would I consider that flavor wheel that you showed? Is I, I always felt that, you know, flavor was subjective, not only in the description of flavors, but uh, you know, like, how, how do you tune an individual sensor, which is subjective for each individual? You know, being an instrument tasteless, I, I find that interesting how you can quantify that. And then the juxtaposition of some of these flavors, like I saw a buttery and I think right next to it was metallic, which I wouldn't necessarily associate, but I guess you gotta put metallic somewhere. Uh, next to like, where would you put body odor? Maybe it was near good or bad cheese, I'm not sure. Uh, so I, I wonder if you could comment on how you quantify flavors and what's the science behind that? Yeah. And the, and the last the last part was, I, I feel that not only is it subjective, you were talking about how, how uh, taste in some sense smell, you, know, you always hear or see the, uh, the wine tasters and that, you know, breathing in and, and trying to get those enzymes and that going through your 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 sense of smell 
but you bring other sensors senses into that. But isn't there also this this connection between prior experiences, prior sensual things in that whole environmental setting, let alone your 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 development as as a young person or whatever, that you bring all these memories flowing back and how that influences these decisions or these quantifications and making it uh, making it more quantitative versus qualitative or subjective. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I really appreciate those comments because I think they really, they're right on. And I, you're absolutely right that flavor is hugely subjective and very much influenced by our pasts, the, the culture we exist and eat within um, you know, our, our, I mean, just, I think blue cheese is one of those that, or, or even coffee or beer or the kinds of things that you kind of learn to appreciate, um, a huge, huge part of it. And there is a book called Neurogastronomy by Gordon Shepherd at Yale that kind of dives into some of that. And then also how flavor changes over time as we get older, our sense of flavor changes, sometimes it decreases and what do we do with that, right? So hugely subjective. And I think that goes to your first question, which is how do we really sort of quantify that mess? And, you know, it's a really good question because there really, there really are two ways. There is the scientific instruments um, and then there is, you know, what you feel. And the, the problem with scientific instruments is as precise as they are, what they really tell you, you know, if, if I were to take my yogurt, put it through a mass spec or GCMS, and out I would get this little diagram, right? And it would tell me exactly what's in there, um, how much is in there. Like, it wouldn't tell me that right away, but I could find that out. But that does not account for the fact that if I give you this much of this molecule and this much of this molecule, you may only sense and pick up this much in terms of the intensity and this much of that. So even if I tell you, well, these molecules are in there, that doesn't necessarily tell me what an even sort of an average person would, would experience. So the GCMS is kind of the closest we have for having instruments do it for us. But there's really nothing that, that can substitute for the human experience. And the only way to really be as scientific as possible about that sensory analysis is to take a group of people. Um, first of all, you, people are always tested that they actually can taste all the five tastes, for example, which is surprising. So if you can't, in, at very low doses. And if you can't, um, then you're off the panel. So you're, you're disqualified. <laughs> and um, then you're kind of trained in terms of, well, this is what metallic means. And this is what buttery means. And a good sensory scientist will kind of be like this, right? Like they can even sit at the end of a mass spec. And there are some mass spec machines that actually have sort of a sniffer at the end where you can sniff the peaks as they come out. And they will just sit there and be like, ripe banana, raw banana, apples, roses, lavender, right? And not only do you have to be able to pick it up, you also have to be able to name it. And you have to be able to name it in a way that fits within the convention of how things smell. But then if you do that enough, if you train people, if you do it with a group of people, and they agree on what terms means, then maybe you're getting close to something, right? Which applies to that group. And maybe in general may apply to other people, but it doesn't apply to everyone. So that's sort of what I would say in general to that. Does that, does that work with your comments? Yes, very much so. It's almost as if like when we, you know, we deal with uh, image detectors, digital detectors and that. and the, the sensory over uh, the spectrum is different. But then the source that we're looking at is different. And so you have to always resolve that. You know, if I'm not sensitive in the blue, is that because the source isn't blue or we're not detecting the blue? So there's always that when you try to standardize an instrument. And I, I was, you know, so thanks for, for cl 
clarifying or at least informing more about how you how you standardize scents yeah. and, and smell and, and all those things because like if you look at mass spec output you go okay i'm thinking okay pleasure readings high or pleasure readings low is sort of some of mine and i'm sure like as you said that taste buds evolve over time or diminish uh so interesting yeah yeah, very common. I mean, it is kind of amazing, I think, that it is one of our senses. And the other senses we kind of understand, like hearing, sight, we kind of get, we know how they work, but we actually don't understand flavor very well, at least not in the details, but we all experience it all the time, every day. So, and, and if you don't, that's not good either. And we should definitely understand it, right? Right. Yeah. Especially in this pandemic, right? That's one of the. Right. Right. <laughs> it goes your sense of smell. Oh my gosh. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I have a question. So, um, um, to what extent do you find that learning the science of cooking encourage more people to become interested in science in general and to to keep learning science and chemistry or physics and say, oh, I didn't know science was so interesting. I want to be a scientist in the future. Yeah, such a good question. I think in general, this touches on something that um, I've been thinking about for a while, which is, so for, for, for a while, it was kind of a new thing to teach science with food, especially to teach physics with food or teach, teach things that are not directly chemistry with food. And it's become more popular over the years. And even now in say the journal of chemistry education, there are, there are a number of papers, right? People are like, oh, I'm using food in my classroom. And this, is, and this is what I did, they say. And then they often leave it at that. And I think there, it's really a really wonderful open area for understanding better why it works. I mean, all these claims I made in the beginning so sure, it's easy to believe it, but does it really work? So I would love um, for for someone to look into people who are exposed to food and cooking in say high school, does, how does that, what is the long-term effect of that? I don't know. I hope you should look into it. I, I'd be happy to help you. <laughs> yeah, we need, to talk, we need to talk more about this idea. We do have some data sets that may partially you know, give a preliminary answer to that, but uh, certainly we need to do more research about, about it. Yeah. yeah. Any questions? Jen, I would actually Perfect. state that it might be easier to do a longitudinal study on this topic than any other science topics that we try to do longitudinal studies on, if only by enticing them by the next wine tasting or, or bake off. <laughs> <laughs> Easier than an Amazon <laughs> gift card, I would say. <laughs> right. yeah. um, um, yeah, another question is that um, do you do you observe a gender difference or preference in this topic? Uh, is it more appealing to women students the men mm. or or the reverse because uh, there's a lot of literature that's suggesting that uh, uh, kitchen chemistry is a way to bring girls into science and uh, some may be even offended by this claim that no are you just <laughs> you no know, keeping women in the kitchen that's not really what we are supposed to do but like what, what what's your what's your observation uh, you know as you teach yeah, that's a good question. I th it's also a great question. I think to that if to to look into, mm -hmm. um, and it's hard. Let's see. I, I mean, what what I would like to think is that cooking of food doesn't have the. I don't. I'm sure you you guys know you know this better than I do, but the sort of stigma that comes with the traditional sciences of, oh no, now I'm doing science and I, I didn't like this. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that it's sort of accessible and inclusive, not just to women, but to, sort of just to people in general who wouldn't think, who don't think they like science, um, right? And whether the cooking helps or hurts there, especially for women, 
I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think it's also in there's a parallel comment on that that I would make, which is the cooking world and the chef world has been extremely male dominated. I mean, all, almost worse than science in some ways, um, which is also changing a little bit. But so what people see, right, is our and we, you know, our first lecture series, and I'm embarrassed to say this, um, luckily I wasn't involved yet, so I, <laughs> I can't blame other people, um, was I think we had one woman out of 12. Now, now obviously we're, we have really changed that and, and that is changing too. But um, I, yeah, I don't know. How do, because there really, there are really are two kinds, two, two aspects to cooking, right? There is the fancy haute cuisine, uh, done, done by the Ferrants and the Rocas and the Heston Blumenthal's. And then there's the kind of home cooking, which has other associations to it. So I could imagine actually that it would depend on which of those you stress, right? If you're stressing the fancy chefs and the, um, you know, the fancy cooking shows, maybe you are, as opposed to the kind of mac and cheese, um, maybe you would see a difference. Good question, really good question. Are your classes, uh, the gen ed, the big three, 300 class, is it pretty gender balanced? It's pretty gender balanced, yeah. Great, any other question, comments? All right, cool. Well, I think, I think, uh, that that's all the questions from us. And thank you so much, Pia, for uh, sharing your work with us. And I will definitely check out your upcoming uh, MOOC on edX, uh, Harvard X. Uh, and I, I wish everything goes smooth there. And I hope that we will have uh, many opportunities to you know, collaborate and, and you know, discuss in the future. Uh, all right. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. So thank you to all of you. Thanks for wonderful questions. And it was really great to be here. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you. you so much. Come visit us again. Yes. I hope I'll see you again soon. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And, and we right. can eat. <laughs> <laughs> right. We will eat.